I would like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Welcome to Nine Cents. Nine Cents is a satanic perspective of our modern world, and I'm your host, Adam Campbell. It's great to have you. It is July the 7th, and I've got a great show for you this week. Before I talk about this show, there's a couple changes that you should be aware of. And for those of you who already are aware, because you pay attention to me in social networking circles, uh, maybe let me ease your mind a little bit. I've been getting a lot of feedback from this. Radio Free Satan and Nine Cents are no longer uh, married to one another. Let let me say that a different way. Nine Cents uh, removed itself from Radio Free Satan Network. It is not because of any animosity. It is not because there's any drama. It is because of a difference of operating opinion. Literally, that's it. Now, there has been some concern brought that, you know, is Nine Cents uh, in line with Satanism still, or is Nine Cents in line with the Church of Satan still? And let me just say, flat out, the Radio Free Satan is not the Church of Satan. So, we need to understand that I am a Satanist. I am an active, a proud active member of the Church of Satan. It's not something I could ever separate myself from. Uh, and, and certainly my show not being a part of the Radio Free Satan Network has literally nothing to do with Satanism or the Church of Satan. So do not make that mistake. And if that's an assumption that you've made, uh, being that there's some weird tie-in with with the Church of Satan and Radio Free Satan, only that it's a satanic network run by active members, produced by active members, uh, for Satanists. I mean, that, that's it. There's no oversight or or um, monopoly on Satanism. Uh, now, Nine Cents will continue doing what I have done for the past two and a half years. Um, nothing's going to stop that. Um, I've, I've, I've long looked at this podcast as, um, and I've produced it, as a satanic perspective, my satanic perspective. And recently, I've been trying to broaden that to uh, not just my satanic perspective, but a satanic perspective. And so I have a number of individuals on uh, giving their take on things, as it were. That will not change, and the evolution of Nine Cents will not change. Now, no longer being a part of the Radio Free Satan Network, brings up some interesting possibilities for Nine Cents. For example, advertising. That was never really a big... Because I was in someone else's network, I allowed them to sort of take the reins, or not, over that concept of advertising. I I never really reached out to anyone. I never... Uh, you know, I've had some people that have wanted to advertise on this show, and I've, I've sort of, you know, pushed them away because I don't want this to be, uh, I didn't want this to be solely about Nine Cents. I wanted it to be about the network, which is why I had these little, you know, fun drives at the beginning of every year talking about how, um, you know, support the network. Um, and you'll you'll note that the RFS intro is no longer at the, the top of the show. Now that I'm no longer a part of that network, I'm free to advertise with whomever I'd like. And so I've started slowly, quietly, building out the website um, to address the concept of advertising. But let me just say it right here. If you are someone um, of worth, if you have a project of worth, and you would like to advertise on nine cents, or you would like to do some form of trade, as in I can have an 
uh, you know, some form of advertising through your means and, and, and you would like some advertising through mine, I am open to it. I mean, you know, all things being equal, I, I don't want to water down what Nine Cents is by having a ton of different, th- you know, commercials essentially running at the beginning, middle, and end of the show. And so I, I will not ever do that. But I do like to promote other Satanists' projects of worth. And if you have something, then please let me know and, and we can talk and we can work something out. I would like to grow Nine Cents continually um, into something greater so that I can, you know, when I'm done with it after nine years, then someone else can take it and, and move it into the future with their perspective at the helm. And that will be fantastic. I want to make sure that this is something of worth that I'm bringing to you, Um, that it's of value to you. And so feedback is the best way I can tell that I'm doing the right thing or the wrong thing. I've gotten a lot of really great feedback. I've gotten a little bit of negative feedback, but I tell you, I love it all because it does nothing but allow me to hone this show for you, make it worth your valuable time, uh, and to entertain you. You know, that's the point. And this week's show is no exception. This week I'm bringing you another episode, episode three, I Dream of Jesse, and this, she's talking about going on holiday. In the infernal informant, Obamacare liar subsidies, and PETA finds itself on receiving end of others' anger. Hmm. And in the creature feature... I'm going to be talking with Jeremiah Crow, a musician, someone who uh, I was pleasantly surprised uh, is a very talented musician, surprised because I, I was not aware of him before we started corresponding, and very pleased to be able to bring that to you, but also that he's contributing to Black House Blues, a project, a musical project that I've been working on for a year or so, and I'm still <laughs> working on. It'll, it'll be really special. Maybe someday. (laughs) Just trying to get things put together. But that's going to be the show. Uh, Another fantastic episode of Nine Cents. I'm I'm very excited to bring it to you. And again, you know, the only way that this show will grow and I can continue bringing you entertainment worthwhile is if you do two things. I know asking you to do anything is is invasive and (laughs) maybe selfish, but... If you enjoy the show, it's for your benefit. So the first thing, let me know. Let me know what you like, what you don't like, what you'd like to see changed, uh, what you'd like to see more of, you know, whatever. And two, tell a friend. Hell, tell an enemy. Tell your grandma. Tell someone else about Nine Cents. Spread the word. The bigger the audience, the larger opportunity I have of bringing you something worthwhile because the more feedback I get from that bigger audience, I'll be able to really hone this show, make it something of worth. So do not worry that I'm no longer a part of the Ready Free Satan Network. Um, We are still on very good terms, and it was just a decision that I had to make for what I perceived as the integrity of the show, and ultimately so I can produce something um, that I'm happy with, in a manner that I'm happy with. So, uh, yeah, no bad blood. Yes, I'm still a very proud member of the Church of Satan. (laughs) Thank you for your feedback, people, but nothing to worry about. Uh, All right, let's go ahead and start the show because it's, it's a good one. Jesse! What do you want? Well, first, Jesse, I'd, I'd, I'd like you to address me as master. I, I am your master, after all. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes, master. That's better. Now, look, I've got guests coming over tonight, and I want you to entertain them. What, do I look like a belly dancer? Uh, I, I assume that was part... I mean, the outfit, it, it kind of suggests... You may be used to dance. Listen, the gin put me in the bottle. He forgot to add the preservatives. Now, the outfit may be wrinkle-free, but what in it ain't. You don't like it? Call the number on the bottle and complain.
In this I Dream of Jesse, we're going to be starting, before running the traditional I Dream of Jesse segment, we're going to talk to Jesse. That's right. I thought it was uh, about time we had her on, and I know I've gotten a lot of really great feedback, and, and people are, are, are really tuning in to what she, you, what she, you, as she's sitting here on the line with me, says. So I'm very, very pleased to invite Jesse. How are you, my dear? I'm doing great, Adam. This is awesome. Uh, I've actually, we, we've communicated before on, on different social networking site, and uh, it's nice to actually have your voice, like one-on-one, you know what I mean? Totally, yeah. It's totally a, a completely different experience. Let me make sure my phone is off, out of context here. So, uh, are you having a good week? Oh, I've been having a great week. It's been a busy weekend with the holiday and all, but, you know. Yeah. Do you do anything special for the 4th at all? Yeah, we go up to my in-laws up in Vermont. And, you know, I mean, every town in Vermont is a small town, but, you know, they have the typical small town parade where you can pretty much just walk up to the people in the parade and talk to them in the middle of the parade. And nobody <laughs> gives a damn. You know, this year they had a car break down and some people came out and helped push it off the road. It was, you know, a good time. <laughs> It sounds like uh, traditional old town America. Very much so. Very much so. That's cool. It's always nice. I, I like just in Utah. We, you know, there's obviously a Salt Lake City parade and everything, and I never really I, I grasped the idea of the the parade carrying through nowadays. It, it, in my opinion, tends to just turn into like this weird candy throwing clown dancing around the local beauty pageant winner who hasn't really done anything or really had any reason to, but sitting in like a convertible waving her hand as if she's someone of importance and the mayor that no one even recognizes or half the people couldn't even give his name, waving his old wretched hand. And then because it's Utah, there's always this weird like... (laughs) Uh, pilgrim era wagon rolling down and then there it's just it's this really weird thing that has nothing to do with uh, the United States independence it's all this weird localized celebrity if you can even call it you, that. you know when you said it was because it was Utah I expected your next thing to be there's always a Joseph Smith you know float going down the parade <laughs> with golden tablets or something that's the tie-in with the pilgrims they're not as overt as that uh, certainly not in Salt Lake at least but it, they're really not that far removed from it either so but yeah, it's it's always, you know, this time of year you sort of gotta swallow it just to enjoy the rest of the festivities, and it's, it's nice to know that that's carrying on even on that um, uh, east coast. Uh, those those folks over there. Yeah, I, I mean, we could actually we could be in the parade. All we'd have to do is just you know decorate a car or something and and <laughs> get there on time and say, hey, we want to be part of it, and we'd be in it. It's it's that that's low key. Funny. That's cool. Yeah. Well, I wanted to have you on the show. Obviously, uh, your voice, maybe, could you give us a little bit of background where where you come from? Um, well, I'm middle-aged, <laughs> work in IT, really, you know, working for the man, not doing anything <laughs> too exciting. I'm probably where the all most, good inspiration comes from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm probably the most boring Satanist out there. <laughs> I love those memes that wander around where it's like uh, what others think a Satanist is and what we really are. Yeah, it's- I'm totally, I I mean, I listen to a little dark ambient music sometimes, but that's probably as close as I come to the whole <laughs> goth side of things. Um, yeah, I, I mean, if you saw me, I look very professional. I mean, I actually, it's 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 a funny thing when I go to a new job. People always get the impression that I'm the smit. I'm going to be the snitch. I'm the one they can't do anything in front of because I'll tell the boss, which I wouldn't because you know I don't give a shit. But I have that look about me, like I'm going to be the one who's kissing the boss's ass all the time. So I think I totally don't fit the bill of you know the the rabble rousing goth type of satanist that a lot of people have. Do you do you use that to your advantage? I would imagine that could be relatively useful. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, I've had a pretty successful career. Nice. And maybe, I don't know, maybe it's just me. Do you ever find 
playing into one's expectations exhausting? I mean, it can it, be. It can yeah. be. Um, I mean, it's. It. I haven't changed jobs many times. I, I like to stay at a job as long as I can. Yeah. And whenever you start a new one, of course, you have to be vanilla. You you really have to be. And that's tough to do because, I mean, it's not that I'm, like I said, I, I'm not all that weird by Satanist standards, certainly, but by normal people's standards, I am a little bit weird. <laughs> and you can't let any of that show at first, you know? Yeah. Like right right now, I've been at my job for seven years, I think, and I've got a line of plastic Halloween skulls on my desk and now nobody bats an eyelash at it because they know me but I couldn't have done that on day one yeah for sure <laughs> who's the weird Halloween lady what is she <laughs> you know you try to tell people it's it's memento mori it sees the day it's you know all about life and living it and they just look at you like why are you obsessed with death and eh, never mind <laughs> <laughs> nice well, what was it that I, I know I reached out to you, but what was the, the willingness to bring your voice to what was behind it uh, to bring your voice to nine cents? Because I would imagine, you know, you, you get this message, you know, we, we maybe have corresponded once or twice or so on, on social networking site where we don't really know each other, don't really know a lot about each other. It may have even been kind of weird that I would, you know, just reach out to you about it. But what what inside of you uh, made you willing to share your thoughts? I have actually been trying to start a blog for probably about two years. And every time I start one, I'll get like three, four posts into it and then just delete it because it's not working out. It's not what I wanted I don't know what's wrong with it. I just know it's not what I wanted. Right. And I think now that I've done your podcast, done a couple of episodes for it, I think the problem I was having with the blog was I was trying to come up with something that was vanilla enough that I could, you know, once I got a few posts on it, tell all of my family and all of my friends and my coworkers, hey, I've got this blog, come check it out. And at the same time, I was trying to express myself and I'm not an out Satanist. So for me to express myself, I can't tell my family and my coworkers and all of them, hey, come check this out because mm -hmm. then I'm self-censoring. And so that was, I, now I realized that was what was going wrong with the blog. It's like I had this desire to express my thoughts, but the avenue I was taking just wasn't working. And when I did your podcast, it's like, okay, this is a satanic podcast. I'm not going to ever tell my family I've done this. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's not censored. It's totally what I'm thinking and feeling. And then just the freedom to express myself, it's exactly what I was looking for. So well, there you go. Yeah, it's, it's a perfect marriage because I'm very, very excited. You have, you have a voice that, that cuts to the core of the subject you're speaking to uh, in a very pragmatic and just you know honest and straightforward way practical way which is in my opinion missing not i mean it you know this this podcast is centered around satanism and we like to discuss things through a satanic lens but what what you speak to isn't necessarily isolated only to a satanic audience you know what i mean i mean you, you could take satan or or satanism out of everything you're saying and it's still solid advice or, or, or interesting uh, context. Um, and so I, I think it's a value, and I'm very excited. Maybe a little sorry that it's only to my audience that's hearing it, because I think that maybe you have a voice that could you know, go a little bit beyond what I'm offering. But I'm very, very pleased that you're uh, contributing, and this week is no exception. So I've been, and I say this week, I've been trying to structure my show a little bit differently than the traditional way I've done it for a number of years now. In that uh, I'm highlighting a different featured voice every week and throughout the month. And I'm trying to set it up so that you're the first of the month, uh, the first, you know, sort of highlighted voice. So from here on out, we're going to be trying to bring um, that uh, I Dream of Jesse segment at the first week of every month. Um, until you grow tired of it and I will be bothering you until you tell me to stop, <laughs> stop bothering you about it. Um, 
I think but, you'll be telling me to shut up first. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's good. Uh, <laughs> but how about we, we dive into this week's episode and um, let me uh, uh, begin that by saying thank you very much for your contribution. I think is absolutely of value and the feedback I've gotten reinforces that. Uh, you're a wonderful witch and uh, I'm very pleased to have your voice. Thank you, Adam. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Here in the U.S., warmer months are upon us, schools are out for summer, and people are traveling. This got me thinking about the words we use to describe this practice. In some parts of the world, it's referred to as going on holiday. Around here, it's called going on vacation or just taking time off. But the words we choose frame our perceptions, and I've noticed the phrases common to my area have negative connotations. The term vacation means you're vacating something. It says you're not at your post. It doesn't say anything about where you are instead. Time off does the same. It's time spent off the job, not time spent on your hobbies, for example. In contrast, the term holiday indicates an observance of something holy. So how do you think about what you do when you aren't working your normal schedule? Are you observing something you deem holy? Or are you simply not doing your job? Life's too short for the latter. But the negative attitude, whether it's caused by our choice of words or just reflected in them, is very prevalent. The popular phrase, getting away from it all, demonstrates this. You'll hear someone say, I want to take a vacation and get away from it all. Or if they're busy, I'm going on a weekend getaway. That's escapism. If you go on vacation to get away from it all because you feel you've just got to escape your life, you're doing it wrong. Not only does a vacation that gets away from it all not deal with the issues you need to deal with, it puts undue pressure on you to make the most of this time off. If you have 50 weeks a year of living a life you don't enjoy, you're going to want to make the most of the remaining two. And if you have to make this the best two weeks of your year, something as simple as losing your luggage is going to ruin it for you. Jet lag combined with a desire to pack in as much activity as possible is just going to wear you down. And then there's the dread of going back to work, hanging over you the whole time like a rain cloud. What if this one chance you've given yourself all year fails to result in the unwavering bliss you were hoping for? Do you take up drinking and read trashy romance novels to get you by until next year? And what if it's a family vacation you're planning? If you've been slacking for the last 50 weeks, not only are you not in a position to enjoy yourself, but you're not going to be fully there for your kids or your partner either. The more control you have over your life, the more you can be there, in the moment, with your loved ones. A family vacation becomes a fun adventure when you're already having fun and then seek adventure, not when you're stressed out and looking for an escape. Going on holiday at the outset should be relatively stress-free. It can't be that if you need to get away from something. And don't confuse this with needing to step back from a situation to gain perspective. That's different. That's short term. Nobody needs to take two weeks away from a situation to gain new perspective. You can do that in at most a couple of days. I'd call that a productive breather. I've also heard people say that they need to take time off to recharge their batteries. Well, maybe that's not escapism, but I'd say it's a clear indication that your life is out of balance. Unless you enjoy running yourself down in some masochistic fashion, recharging your batteries is something you should be doing every day, or at most every week. The cost of taking a trip also needs to be considered, since this is often something people stress over before, during, and after the event. I'm not going to tell you never to put expenses on credit. I absolutely believe that there are trips important enough to warrant accruing a bit of finance charge. But this all comes down to how much control you have over your finances. I make enough and travel cheaply enough that I can go on holiday and charge it all, pay it all off when the bill comes due. If I couldn't pay it off immediately and the trip was a once-in-a-lifetime event that really mattered to me, I wouldn't bat an eyelash at carrying a balance for a few months while paying finance charge on it. Money's only worth what you spend it on, and if you're observing something you consider holy, it's worth spending money on it. It's common to hear vacation advice that talks about keeping within your budget. On the whole, if you're worried about your budget, maybe you shouldn't be taking the trip. But if your budget's tight, and yet you know yourself to be in control, and you really want something, don't be afraid to go for it just because other people think you can't afford it. I mean, I'm all in favor of living debt-free as a general rule, but to act as if accruing manageable debt is a sin is wrong. It's not being irresponsible, it's being your own god. And that brings up the issue of self-discipline. It's hard to believe I've spent this much time talking about going on holiday without specifically mentioning self-discipline. If you're exercising self-discipline for the 50 weeks you're working, then the two-week trip can be much more indulgent. 
Self-discipline means fitting in all the stuff that needs to get done into your regular schedule. This should include home repairs, doctor visits, car maintenance, etc. I mean, some medical procedures and family obligations might necessitate using part of your paid time off, but when possible, this should be avoided. Lots of employers allow flex time, particularly for their top performers, a group you no doubt belong to because you're so self-disciplined. Self-discipline also means keeping your finances under control on a day-to-day basis so you're confident you can afford the holiday you're going on. And it means eating well and exercising. That way, when you go on holiday, you don't need to worry about portion size while dining out, nor will you get winded if you spend an entire day exploring your chosen destination. Self-discipline means not letting yourself operate on low batteries for extended periods of time. If you're being worked like a dog, change the situation. And it means dealing with issues as they come up, and only then indulging in a bit of alcohol or a trashy romance novel as time permits. A disciplined life is relatively stress-free. It's not something you'll need or want to get away from. When you live a self-disciplined life, going on holiday isn't about what you're getting away from or the position you're vacating. It's about what you're looking forward to doing and seeing. It puts the emphasis on what you've chosen to celebrate as a holy experience. And as the sun sets on your last holy day, you can look forward to getting back to the old routine, which you've managed to make into a pretty damn enjoyable life to indulge in for the next 50 weeks. Psst. Hey, hey. Hey, come here. Psst. What? Huh? Me? Do I know you? Hey, you're a religious man, aren't you? No more than anyone else? Listen. Listen, I got a secret. It's, it's been eating me up, and I gotta share it with someone. Get the fuck out of here, kid. I don't know you. No, listen, man. It's about you. It's about your life. You're about to have what, what alcoholics refer to as your moment of clarity. What are you talking about? Are you okay, son? Sins are indisposable to every society organized on an ecclesiastical basis. They are only reliable weapons of power. The priest lives upon sins. It's it's necessary to him that there be sinning. Who the fuck are you, kid? I'm your infernal informant. Alright, I would like to take a quick moment before I start the infernal informant segment to say thank you very much to Jimmy Psycho. It was his, the Jimmy Psycho experiment that led me to reach out to him and ask him to produce, literally create, a I Dream of Genie uh, tiki style track that we could use in this segment. Uh, he's been a fantastic artist and he was willing to do it and I was very, very happy with the end result and I think you will be too. Uh, after having heard it, uh, go check out the Jimmy Psycho Experiment. His Mad Monster Cocktail Party album is available as we speak. Just go to jimmypsycho.com and you'll be able to find the links that are pertinent to purchasing it online or iTunes or uh, whatever. But definitely check it out. Uh, talented man. Thank you very much, Jimmy. I really appreciate it. Uh, you kick ass, man. All right, so let's talk a little bit about news. That is a segment, right? Let's start with the Wall Street Journal. World. Let me move down. This whole thing just spun out of control. Obamacare's liar subsidies. And this was posted four hours ago. The White House says you can sign up without further verification. The White House seems to regard laws as mere suggestions, including the laws it helped write. On the heels of last week's one-year suspension of the Affordable Care Act's employer mandate to offer insurance to workers, the administration is now waiving a new batch of its own Obamacare prescriptions. Those disclosures arrived inside a 606-page catch-all final rule that the Health and Human Services Department published on July 5th, a classic Friday news dump with extra credit for the holiday weekend. HHS now says it will no longer attempt to verify individual eligibility for insurance subsidies and instead will rely on self-reporting, with minimal efforts to verify if the information consumers provide is accurate. Remember, liar loans... The low or no documentation mortgages that took borrowers at their word without checking pay stubs or W-2s? Obamacare is now on the same honor system, with taxpayers in tow. People are supposed to receive subsidies only if their employer does not provide federally approved health benefits. Since HHS 
now won't require businesses to report those benefits to enforce the standards until 2015. It says it can't ask Obamacare's exchange bureaucracies to certify who qualifies either. HHS calls it a slight technical correction, though it is much more than that. The exchanges will not only start dispensing benefits based on an applicant's attestation about his employment insurance status. The HHS is also handling the exchanges, temporarily expanded discretion to accept an attestation of projected annual household income without further verification. In other words, anyone can receive subsidies tied to income without judging the income they declare against the income data the Internal Revenue Service collects. This change has nothing to do with the employer mandate, even tangentially. HHS is disowning eligibility quality control because pre-clearance is not feasible as a result of operational barriers, and a large amount of systems developed on both the state and federal side, which can occur in time for October 1, 2013. You gotta love that passive voice. It's true that coordinating and managing vast amounts of information from hundreds of millions of Americans and corporations and monitoring compliances with more than 10,000 pages of fine print Federal Register regulations so far is hard to do, yet that is the system Democrats installed when they passed the law, which is not supposed to be optional due to administrative incompetence. HHS promises to develop a more robust verification process someday, but the results starting in October may be millions of people getting subsidies who don't legally qualify. This would mean huge increases in Obamacare spending. Some of these folks could be fraudsters. Much as 21-25% to of earned income tax credits flow to people who aren't eligible, according to the Treasury Inspectors General. The same error rate for Obamacare would amount to as much as $250 billion in improper payments in its first decade. The irony in this case of Obamacare is that the liberal health policy is predicated on the notion that if Congress commands something on paper, it will happen in the real world. Architect Peter Orzag and Ezekiel Emanuel are still claiming against all evidence that their policy experiments in human behavior modification will yield huge cost savings. Yet now we are discovering that Democrats passed a bill that is so large and convoluted that even they can't implement it in practice. So don't be surprised if millions of individuals decide they're eligible for the subsidies or should be and wait for someone eventually to say they aren't. Liberals are also now claiming that the employer mandate and these eligibility rules were never important parts of Obamacare. This is revisionist history, not least because the mandate and eligibility limits help reduce the cost as measured by the Congressional Budget Office. The revisionism is also false because every provision of Obamacare is supposed to solve a problem created by some other provision of the bill. Kick out one of the struts in that business mandate and the whole apparatus becomes even more unstable. In the case of lawless decisions to shelve any income or employer insurance scrutiny, HHS's logistical challenges are real. But our bet is that the administration is also using them as a pretense in a deliberate bid to make it much easier to join the, join the exchanges. That's because the health planners are terrified that enough healthy, low-cost people won't sign up, and therefore the Affordable Care Act's strict regulations and underwriting and risk pooling will blow up insurance markets. As more and more of Obamacare tumbles, the administration is resorting to anything that can salvage the goal of permanently expanding the U.S. entitlement state. All of this fits with Obamacare's entire bloody-minded history. Not sure where that comes from. Democrats were determined to make their rendezvous with liberal destiny of government-run health care, so they imposed the debacle on the country on a partisan vote, and despite public opposition, now that they are discovering how difficult it is to remake one-sixth of the U.S. economy, they are rewriting the law so they go and tell Americans they have no choice but to live with the consequences. Interesting. Interesting. This did not list who the author was. I'd be interested. 
I'd be interested to know about that. This is an opinion. Um, okay, so a, a couple things. M my take on this, it it's projecting catastrophe in a decade and sums of cost in a decade. But in the article, it admits that this is just foregoing verification until 2015. Of course, with Obama out of the White House and whoever comes in next, who knows if it'll even exist by then, so will it matter by then. But what Washington loves to do is kick the can down the road and let someone else deal with it, and then it never ever actually ends up getting dealt with. Uh, again, however, I don't believe, um, I don't believe Obamacare is being framed in the right way. It's certainly when they say that the majority of the public is against it. Because that's factually incorrect. Um, they may not like Obama, or they may not like the term Obamacare as it's been framed in our vernacular. But, Obamacare, i.e. the Affordable Care Act, is uh, actually something that everyone agrees with. And more to the point, it didn't go far enough. Now, I've spoken to this in the past, so I won't go, you know, over the entire uh, rant verbatim again here, but to um, touch on a few notes. If you are caught in fraudulent behavior, behavior um, claiming that you should receive subsidies uh, because of a lie, then you will be prosecuted as a civilian. One thing that you can always tell about America, it will always go against its civilian population, not against its corporate owners. So, we have the civilians. You lie about it, like this post or this uh, essay says you will, this article, uh, and you will suffer the consequences. Um, but like I was saying earlier, it, it's not framing it in the right way. We have a nanny state right now. We have an entitlement state right now. It's called the emergency room. Does, does no conservative understand this very basic concept? The problem is there's no accountability. There's, there's no one saying that you have to pay your way. You can just go in, say you, you can't afford it, and then they take care of you because they have to. You can't get more nanny state than that. At least with the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, you're forced to pay for the care you receive. You would think that every conservative in this environment would appreciate that, especially because a lot of these concepts were brought up by Republicans. But again, we're working in a pre- <laughs> I'm sorry, a post-Obama world where every Republican has overtly declared that they will not ever support anything this president do does, and their whole goal is to see him fail. Okay, that's fine. He does some deplorable things I, I really don't agree with, but you're, you're messing with people's health care. Now, when it comes to the realities of implementing these policies that weren't in existence anymore, I can, I can understand a little bit of leeway easing into it, because it, it's going to be a big, big, time-consuming, manpower uh, problem. But you also have to realize, we are drawing down government jobs in other areas. Just last week, we were talking about military bases shutting, which means an entire civilian workforce being put on their asses. Verification of uh, these claims of uh, health insurance subsidies is a Another great way to employ those people who are losing their jobs. So it's not without its virtue. I'm not backing the entire thing. I really did not think they went far enough with this. I do not believe it's an entitlement of health to have health care, but I do believe that a good government will, uh, whose sole job is to protect and serve the people, would actually maybe do it. <laughs> protect and serve the people. I think uh, private exchanges would be great if they worked, but that's what we have now. It's called healthcare and it doesn't work very well. So I, I do think that we should have a, a public single payer um, system. And I, you know, I, I do think that we could do it successfully, but because this is a liberal idea, a progressive idea, 
No one on the right will take it seriously. Most Democrats won't take it seriously. And so it is just a dream. Uh, Obamacare, it's really not a negative thing, people, but it's also not a great thing. The next article here is the New York Times. PETA finds itself on receiving end of others' anger. This is by Michael Winnerup, published July 6. Norfolk, Virginia. Even some supporters do not know what to make of it. PETA, considered by many to be the high-profile animal rights group in the country, the highest, kills an average of about 2,000 dogs and cats each year at its animal shelter here. And the shelter does few adoptions. 19 cats and dogs in 2012 and 24 in 2011, according to state records. At a time when the major animal protection groups have moved to a no-kill shelter model, people for the ethical treatment of animals remains a holdout, confounding some and incensing others who know the organization is a very vocal advocacy group that does not believe animals should be killed for food, fur coats, or leather goods. This is an organization that on Thanksgiving urges Americans not to eat turkey. Honestly, I don't understand it, says Joni e. Schaffner, an animal rights lawyer and an associate professor at George Washington University Law School, which hosts an annual no-kill conference. PETA does lots of good for animals, but I can never support them on this. As recently as a decade ago, it was common practice as shelters to euthanize large numbers of dogs and cats that had not been adopted. But the no-kill movement has grown very quickly, leaving PETA behind. In New York last year, 8,252 dogs and cats were euthanized, compared with 31,701 in 2003. Though spay, neuter, transfer, and adoption programs, we think, I'm sorry, through, we think New York can close the gap towards becoming a no-kill community by 2015. And Matthew Berkshire, <laughs> Berkshire, Berkshadiker? Holy shit, I can't say that word. Uh, the president and chief executive of the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, one of 150 rescue groups and shelters that make up the Mayor's Alliance of New York City's animals. While there is no uniform definition of what constitutes a no-kill community, it is generally considered to be a place where at least 90% of dogs and cats at local shelters are put up for adoption. In the first quarter of this year, 84% of the dogs and cats from the New York Rescue Groups and Shelters were adopted, transferred, or returned to their owners, compared with 76% of all of 2012. For their part, officials at PETA, which has its headquarters and only shelter here in Norfolk, says the animals at rescue are in such bad shape from mistreatment and neglect that they are often better off dead than living in misery on the streets or with abusive owners. It's nice for people who've never worked in a shelter to have this idealistic view that every animal can be saved, said Daphne Nakminovich, uh, PETA's vice president for cruelty investigations. They don't see what awful physical and emotional pain these poor dogs and cats suffer. Over the past 30 years, PETA has run highly publicized campaigns targeting corporations for the way they treat animals, taking aim at Ringling Brothers, Circus Elephants, McDonald's, Chickens, and General Motors, Test Crash Pigs. Their annual We Rather Go Naked Than Wear Fur campaign featuring nude models is a public relations legend. But lately, the protester is being protested. PETA has become the number one target amongst supporters of no-kill shelters, and the annual conference at George Washington being held next week, seminars focused on ways to challenge PETA's policy. Nathan J. Winograd, a leading no-kill activist, criticized PETA on his blog recently for its long and sorbid training of undermining the movement to end shelter killing. There are no national figures in the number of shelters adopted or euthanized each year, but several states keep records, as do a few private organizations. From that data, the trend is clear. Adoptions are up, and euthanasia is down. In California, for example, 176,900 dogs were euthanized in 2011, compared with 303,000 in 97, when the state started keeping track. In the same period, adoptions had climbed to 137,700 from 84,000. Here in Virginia, 61,591 dogs and cats were euthanized last year compared with 103,000 
327 and 04. Out the front door is a blog that tracks no-kill communities, lists 171 that currently meet the 90% save rate in 20, or sorry, 2001. There was just one, Tompkins County in upstate New York. The no-kill conference at George Washington attracts 860 people in 2012. In 25, at the same first gathering, two dozen attended. More than any other group, Maddie's Fund, a foundation in the San Francisco Bay Area with a $300 million endowment, has been responsible for the spreading of the no-kill movement. Starting in 99 by Cheryl and David A. Duffield, a dot-com billionaires, uh, named after their pet miniature schnauzer, the organization has underwritten several national programs promoting the movement. They have financed shelter care medical training programs at 18 of the country's 29 veterinary schools. The idea being that a healthy animal is cheaper to hold, um, sorry, to house and more likely to be adopted. Each year, the foundation sponsors an adoption weekend in several cities. In New York, early last month, 3,104 dogs and cats were adopted. As an incentive, Maddie's Fund paid the shelters $500 for each dog and cat under seven years that was adopted, $1,000 for each animal over seven, and $2,000 for each animal over seven with a medical ailment. It teaches the shelters that old and uglies are not discards, said Richard Avanzino, the director of the foundation which spent $3 million to subsidize the 3,104 adoptions. We're changing the culture by showing that no kill can work. Mr. Avanzio called PETA's public, I'm sorry, policy of killing virtually all animals at its shelter outdated and absolutely idiotic. And it goes on. So I, I thought it was funny, which is why I wanted to bring this, that PETA is being targeted for, and I believe I've even spoken to this before, uh, being targeted for their uh, murdering of <laughs> the animals that they really go crazy on other people for eating. But, you know, whatever. You know, let them be the hypocrites they are. Look, I love animals. I, well, not all animals. I really like, for pets, I, I dig dogs. I'm a dog guy. I don't really like cats at all. Can't stand them. But I like dogs, probably because I'm allergic to them. But I like dogs, and, and so I understand, and I can appreciate and accept uh, animal rights activists to a point. What we need to keep in mind is that, I, I understand, they, they take this concept that all, you know, all animals are on evil ground, uh, even ground, <laughs> Freudian slip, and that anyone who kills them is evil and, you know, whatever. Okay, we, we've heard that demonizing in, in very various other avenues. Um, we are the top of the food chain, people. We are omnivores. We're sub, we're, we literally have evolved and, and continue to live because we eat what is available. And uh, when we have a certain hunger from our palate requests, we go out of our way to get it. We eat animals. This is who and what we are as human beings. So PETA can eat a dick. I, I, you know, I have no sympathy for people who spend that much money on advertising and not on their cause. It is insane. Um, more to the point when they're so hypocritical that they, and disruptive, that they uh, yeah, kill the, the dogs. That th Though I have to say, they have a point. And uh, I'm going to give them this. It is unrealistic to think that every animal should be rescued. It is unrealistic. Animals can be, just like human beings, ridiculously abused and they will never recover. They will never live a happy life. This is what it means to be an animal in the world. I mean, you are affected by the world, and some of you can get past of it, and some of you can't. And these animals, they've deemed to be uh, unresponsive and unable to live happy lives. They just murder. Awesome. Go, PETA. <laughs> I say it with, you know, glib, but I do actually believe that they're right there. I, I do think that, you know, some animals need to be put down because there's no way of them living a fulfilling life uh, in, in what I would deem that as uh, being a contribution to another being, meaning either another animal or another human being uh, having some contribution. Uh, you know, put them down. Realistically, we have so many uh, unwanted pets right now. I, I think we could do with thinning the herd, so to speak. And I know that sounds horrible. 
but it's it's a realistic perspective. And uh, as Satanists, we have to be realists because that's who and what we are. All right, and that's going to do it for the Infernal Informant. Thank you for sitting through that. How about, yeah, let's do a little creature feature. You guys are going to dig this. What's this show called? What do you mean, what is it called? You know, what's the name of the show? What, like the title? What, what's the title of the show? Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, what's the big deal? What's the title of the show? Look, it should be good enough for you and for any of you other generation Y's or X's or W's or Z's or, or, or whatever fancy letter you're, you're sitting on today to, to realize that it's not about what the title is. It's not about... When I was your kid, there's only one thing that we had growing up. When we wanted to watch a show, we just turned on the telly uh, in Saturday mornings, and you know what we got? Do you know? Do you have any idea that what we got? No, I have no idea. Why are you freaking out? Every single Saturday, and we didn't know what shows were, what what titles were, or or what. We, we had no choices on what to watch. We were stuck with the creature feature, and so are you. Welcome to another Creature Feature. I'm being joined today by Jeremiah Crow. Now this is a gentleman who uh, was a listener and that is actually how I stumbled across his music. He would sent me some great feedback about the podcast itself and thank you very much for that. And because I'm, I don't know, a creeper maybe, I actually saw the last little bit of his email address and I searched that website and I found out he's actually a really fucking talented uh, musician, and I was pleasantly surprised. So, uh, we've been talking via email for a little bit. This is actually the first time I've been able to catch him voice to voice. How are you, Jeremiah? I'm doing very good, and I'm glad you find me creepy. <laughs> no, I, I meant me for, for tracking down, but <laughs> there is a creepy tone, and, and we'll be talking about that in a minute here, about your music specifically. So, uh, like I was mentioning, you're a musician, you have, it looks like a couple of albums that are available for purchase, uh, certainly from your website, and if you, uh, the listener, want to check this out while we're speaking, jeremiahcrow.com is the website. But, uh, I mean, we, I also, like, dragged, I don't know if it's kicking and screaming, but I dragged you into the Black House Blues Project, and I'm hoping uh -huh. what we have is going to be of interest. But, uh, yeah, let me, let me ask you a little bit about yourself before we dive into the tunage, uh, if you would be so kind. What, uh, tell me a little bit about Jeremiah. Jeremiah grew up in the uh, Appalachian Mountains of Pennsylvania. Right now, I live about 45 minutes from where I grew up, and, um, Literally, the first 15 years of my life was the absolute boondocks. Um, I lived in a, an area of the Appalachian Mountains that is called the Ridges and Valley. There are just very narrow back roads, ridges surrounding each side, and on uh, at the bottom of each ridge is where we would build our houses, or where my parents did. And I lived um, um, close to my uh, my relatives. All lived down the same road as me, I guess, and and behind me, my grandfather owned all the land, so growing up, I had the entire ridge to play on wow. all by myself, and um, which was kind of neat, too, because on the other side of it, there was an abandoned house, and uh, this place was owned by um, people that was that were called, their last name was Campbell, and um, in the 1960s, they left, and um, I was playing in that like around the 80s or so, and I really enjoyed anyways um, all things, I like horror movies and things like that, and I had my own haunted house, what I thought was kind of cool, and Saturday afternoons, there would be the um, chiller theater would come on, and, um, and even growing up in that area too, there's a lot of impoverished areas as well. So I, I got to see firsthand um, some of these people that really did live in um, well-made shacks. Really wasn't much more other than that. And um, and also the area was known for now supposedly I never came across it, but there was um, a large um, moonshine distillery going oh, on somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and my um, my grandfather, his um, brother, got caught with some moonshine. So <laughs> I'm assuming that somewhere, you know, because I was so young, I didn't know exactly where to get into that but um mm -hmm. but yeah that, that was um yeah that was kind of my upbringing it really was out in the boondocks when i was um 15 i i moved to just outside of um um hershey actually hershey pennsylvania is um close to where i'm living now so um i i did get civilized a bit <laughs> going up, but uh but beforehand um yeah it really was kind of like the dukes of hazard in real life i mean you would see um 
that your general stereotype of mountain folk really isn't far from the truth by any means. Well, let me ask you something, and, and let me preface it with this here. Um, I my, I'm one generation removed from hillbilly, uh, according uh-huh. to my mom. She she came she, and met uh, my father in Gary, Indiana, and her parents and grandparents, um, full fledged as she termed it, hillbilly. So mm-hmm. when I ask the question, I don't, you know, taking the spirits intended, I'm, I'm not trying to yeah. you know, be negative because there certainly is maybe with popular culture, this negative connotation with it. But do you consider yourself um, having been raised in a hillbilly lifestyle? No, I, I, no, not at all. My parents were, my dad was actually from a city, but he went to that area because there was a military school. Mm-hmm. So he couldn't keep himself in line when he was younger. He was sent there. <laughs> And my 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 mom, as well as my whole mom's side of the family, they're very much open minded about things. Um, so no, I, I mean I, I didn't grow up, you know, sipping on Mountain Dew out of a baby bottle or anything. Like that. <laughs> no, it, was, it was um, and you know, and actually for the most part, too, the people I surrounded myself with, which you know, generally in life you surround yourself with people that are most like you. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, you know, none of us were wearing bib overalls or anything like that. You know. For, <laughs> We're all skateboarding and uh, you know, listening to punk rock music and stuff like that. But the older generation, it it was pretty obvious. You know, the people that were, especially the older people. Yeah, um, yeah you, you could definitely see that. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, I was, you know, not sure I should ask the question because some people do take great offense. My wife is one of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but it, and, and it's weird because we... I don't know why there's a negative connotation about it because some of America's truly amazing music comes out of that culture. Um, Absolutely. And I don't know if you can call it a culture, but it it, it certainly is a lifestyle uh, born of a, a little bit of a necessity maybe at first, but mm-hmm. then it's almost like this protected thing I've found. Yeah, that's true. And, and the music itself, I, I find very unique, especially back in the 1920s, mm. late 20s, early 30s, the, with like Doc Boggs and oh, what was his name? Bean Hambone and or something <laughs> like that. I mean, these were guys with just one instrument pouring it all out. And um, actually, uh, Appalachian music is also influenced by African-American blues as well. Yeah. And there's a, a European influence, of course, like the Irish and Scottish contributed uh, fiddle music. And um, yeah, I mean, I always found that interesting. It's um, it's its own type of music. And even growing up, we would go to county fairs and so forth. And and, and these people are, I mean, what they're doing, I mean, they're the best of what they do, yeah. you know, and it and it really it's wonderful to see that live and to see that type of uh, heritage still being preserved. Do you think and I don't I mean, I don't want to stress this idea too much because I'm not entirely sure I believe any of it. But do uh-huh. you think that there's even a heritage element? I, I, I mean, it, it seems like music is ingrained in this um this culture that we're speaking to it's it's right. something that is passed down from generation and it may be because of a lack of traditional entertainment uh right. it may be uh just you know taking pride in one's heritage and ancestry but you know like you said it, it came from the old world wherever that was for that individual uh, lineage and so you know they wanted to cherish and champion it and pass it on to their children so it I'm not entirely sure what my, my question here is developing into, but do you think, think it's something that's ingrained within them or it's just a learned behavior? Yeah, uh, probably the latter. I I think that um, people, I mean, there is a sense of pride where these people do come from and they are proud to be um, passing on old uh, like English ballads and um, hymn songs and so forth. Mm-hmm. But I think that... Um, yeah, for the most part, ex- especially when I was talking about the African American blues being influenced in it as well, probably not so much. Um, you know, it's it's not so much just a uh, single core anymore. Yeah. It's definitely spread out. Uh, I don't know if this answered your question or not, but no, that's fine. Let, okay, let me transition <laughs> a little bit here, if we can. I mean, obviously, the podcast is centered around the the concept of uh, a satanic voice or perspective. So uh, you're a Satanist. What? How did you discover this? Discover Satanism. 
Satanism, I discovered in my early teens, I I would go, I, I mean, I, I would go to the library and look up the occult and so forth. And I came across a book by Arthur Lyons. I think it's called Satan Once You. Mm-hmm. And um, in that book was pictures of Anton LaVey. And that was the very first time that I came across Anton, the Church of Satan. And even looking at him and with his uh, two daughters, you know, they were very pretty at that time. And I, he didn't really seem much like a creep or anything like that. You know, he kind of seemed like a stand-up person. And that was my uh, first introduction into it. I then got the Satanic Bible shortly after, and I realized, well, you know, this, you know, it's a pragmatic, you know, thought. It completely makes sense. There's by that time also, even though I did grow up going to church, um, probably around my junior high years, I wasn't really buying it so much. So, what was yeah. the denomination? It was the First Church of God. I'm not even familiar with that. Familiar with that, but um, it seems to be uh, very much in this area. It's it's a very conservative mindset. There's a lot of um, either it's our way or no way. Mm-hmm. It, and um, and there's things like, uh, you know, they'll do uh, several different types of baptizing and foot washing and things like that. It was nothing that um, – also, you know, I went to Bible school as well. And um, I can remember there was a point where we – you know, I was just a little kid around eight years old or so, and we had to answer questions and uh, on a sheet of paper. And we handed them, handed them in to the, to the lady that was teaching the class, and she immediately went upstairs and the uh, – the minister came down, grabbed me out of the class, and saved me right away. <laughs> Apparently, he saw something in there he didn't like, maybe something of logic. Um, <laughs> but that's what uh, appealed to me about Satanism. I mean, it is logic. And um, you, know, you look at yourself as a person. There's nothing beyond this. And that's what uh, it you know truly spoke to me at that time. Uh-huh. And it still does. Um, and I'm sorry, uh, when was this again for you? Uh, probably my junior high years. Junior you high. know. Yeah, I seem to hear that a lot uh, amongst people, and and I don't know if it's just that, that curiosity phase in their lives where they're looking outside of what they're used to. Did your did you ever talk to your parents about it? Uh, no, never. So do they know today? No, they don't, and I I really don't have a need as of yet to really bring it up because they are just so open. Mm-hmm. Um, and I well, not really even caring that much about religion in general. I think if I were to bring it up, they would just be like, oh, that's nice. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, I don't think uh, there's really a need to. I mean, other than um, yeah, my immediate family, you know, my wife knows, of course, and um, my daughter will know when she gets older. But yeah. other than that, I mean, also when it comes to things like that, I, something I really don't talk to my folks about very much anyways. No, I, I totally understand. Let me ask you, because you'd mentioned, you know, your daughter will obviously just family unit. She'll find out who and what you're about um, when she, you know, in her time. Is this something you've thought about? Like, you know, your, your daughter comes into the room, sees the Satanic Bible. Mm-hmm. I, I, has it ever crossed your mind how you'll address that? Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, I, I think I'll, I'll just be open about it. Mm-hmm. I'll just tell her that, um, you know, many people have different paths they take in life and and uh what is most common which um even in this area here um i live close to lancaster pennsylvania right now and it's um you know the amish are here it's it's a very um conservative area and i know already she she knows of jesus even though it was never spoken to her in this house but yeah i mean it's definitely yeah these it will be something that I'll approach with caution, but I won't hold back from by any means. I'll, I guess I'll just have to see um, what, you know, just ask her questions and kind of see where she's at with it. And at that time, I'll just, you know, delve into it if I would. Yeah, and, and it is kind of weird, and I don't want to sort of put words in your mouth here, but I know with uh, my children, it's it's sort of this um, big because we, you and I, were raised in a religious uh, institution, we know what the stereotypes are. Uh, but children don't do that. They have to be taught that. And if they're not taught that at home, then it's a totally, totally, completely different vernacular that, that you know, Satan and Satanism for them than it was for us. And so it's, it is challenging to think, well, inevitably this is going to come up but because right. we haven't treated it the way that our parents or maybe the community we lived in treated it we have to deal with it completely differently 
And it is something worth taking, you know, some time to think about and, and work out in your head because the questions will come up. I mean, I, I have a, a gigantic sigil of Baphomet in my in my room. And so, you know, mm. my son and his friends, they all come over and see it. And obviously my son has never been introduced to Satanism formally. And certainly he's never been introduced to uh, Christianity formally either. But it is, like you just mentioned, something that they pick up along the way just through um, forms of speech that instructors like teachers and, uh, you know, other adults the grocery market or whatever share with one another and so he has this concept of satan and i'm sure your daughter does too so it, it is it, it's always something that's just you know in the back of my head for other parents you know how, how are you going to deal with that because uh, i'm kind of dealing with it now and it's interesting <laughs> it's different right yeah so far my daughter thinks that the image of the devil is a cool looking dude so <laughs> in our in our living room i have a, a bobblehead satan and he's wearing a, a suit and tie and nice. he's like hey look at that the devil I'm like yeah. Yeah, yeah, no peace for you. That's great. Well, I, I don't want to stray too far here because I did want to talk to you about your music. The, and, and let me start by saying uh, we're going to be playing a song here in Vein of Sin, and this is from your album Dark Appalachian Gospel. Your, and, and the audience here, will this will be paid off because they're going to hear it. You have a very, very original, not just voice, but but tone in the music and and i don't know if it's um part like like i don't know how do you how do you categorize your music um there is a genre out there that's called dark roots music and i think uh, that's what closely resembles what i'm doing it is um often songs that are that are hymns but kind of sung with tongue and cheek so forth. There are um, traditional folk music instruments incorporated into this. There is, a, you know, of course, always the banjo and the acoustic guitars. There, there's the washboard, the uh, musical saw, and so forth. And there's a, there is a company out there. They're now defunct. They were called, um, I think, they're called the Devil's Ruins Records, and they put out a compilation. And the very first double disc compilation I came across was Rodens, Rodentia, the best of dark roots music, and. Um, it's not – it's similar to what I'm doing. It's not quite I, – I tend to take more of a cut rate approach to it. My uh, my recording isn't as sophisticated as theirs and so forth because I really wanted this to be sort of a low-brow, backwoodsy feel to it. Mm -hmm. But um, if anyone were to look up like bands such as Sons of Perdition or Those Poor Bastards, you'll come across this whole new genre. that and I did it probably about five years ago or so. So that, that – um, that type of music definitely was a huge influence on me, as well as the older, like, 20s and 30s folk music. Nice. And do you consider this, I don't know, maybe a, a line of neo-folk? Yeah, I would think so. Definitely with influence of horror in it as well, or just things creepy. Yeah? Yeah, I believe so. Nice. When you were uh, a young man, did you see yourself as a musician? Is this something that was just in your family? Yeah, and there's a lot of other musicians in my family. But for me, I when I was very young, I played the saxophone, and um, and as I got older, I got out of that and started playing bass guitar. So I've been playing bass guitar since my teenage years. So it's been a you know a little over 20 years now. Yeah. But um, also, I played with you know various other bands and projects and so forth. And you're always being uh, restricted a bit, you know, especially to the type of genre that you're playing. So I wanted to do something that was just completely me, that was my own. So that's when I came up with my project, Jeremiah Crow's Insufferable One Man Show. And that's just me. You know, I'm just doing, I taught myself how to play acoustic guitar um, and banjo as well. I have rudimentary skills in these instruments, but, but I want my music to be minimalistic. So I think it fits perfectly. Nice. Do you ever feel... Uh... I don't know, may, negative criticism maybe pushing you to try for a more... Well, first, I guess the question would be, have you ever received a negative criticism? But then a follow-up to that, um, if I can make some uh, giant leaps ahead, uh, would that, or has that ever influenced you to want to refine the sound? No, not at all. I, I'm very happy with what I'm doing. I, I mean, I understand that I think everyone should take their craft mm -hmm. to the next level. But this is one exception where I don't really want it to go to the next level so much. I, I think because 
hopefully my creativity will will help it progress as compared to getting better on the guitar or getting better on the banjo. Because if I start doing that, then I'm just going to sound exactly like the folk music that's already been done. Right. So, so that's what I, I enjoy what I'm doing with, with especially the banjo. I'm just, I'm throwing in highlights. I'm, I'm also making a sour sound out of these um, instruments too. Um, Cause uh, when I was teaching myself to play the acoustic guitar and banjo, it's very cheerful. And this was not a sound that I wanted at all. I'm more influenced by what I don't like. So I started coming up with my own chords. Um, sometimes I, the guitar I play is out of tune purposely. You know, I, I just look at it. This is just another part of my art. You know, I, I mean, I create all types of different things. I do paintings as well and so forth. And and this is just another part of it. Well, I mean, you know, for what it's worth, I I think what you're doing it it resonates with me i'm not entirely sure why where does this darkness that is inherent in this music come from it's just me man just me <laughs> it's from my um well I, you know also like i i was displaying a little bit well i always enjoyed horror movies ever since i was a little kid you know and seeing the old universal monsters and so forth and reading horror literature yeah. it was a it was a huge influence on me but also um I, I was gone for quite some time. When I was 19, I went to an art school in Pittsburgh, and I didn't come back for 12 years. And Whoa. when I came back here, um, I was reminiscing a bit. You know, I, I, I visited the old area that I grew up with and so forth. And definitely living out in the uh, the woods, it, it, it tends to be a bit scary. You know, I mean, at night, you'll hear these odd noises. You'll hear screams sometimes which I, I'm assuming is just a screech owl or something like that. But when you're out there and everything's so dark, it's just um, – and there's decay around and so forth. And, and like the old house I used to visit, you know, it, there's a um, there's definitely a feel of, um, of, of darkness. I mean I don't really see it as dark, but it needs to be labeled, you know, yeah. so it, it's hard. You know, but yeah, that's what I brought into this because really I, it's, I, I just enjoy all things creepy and that's what I wanted to do with my music. I, I absolutely understand what you're saying. I mean, that's the entire reason I actually am a hiker and a camper, and, uh, because I, I want to connect with that isolation uh, feeling you get when you're just out in the middle of nowhere, and, and it's literally you and, uh, you know, the worms at your feet and the, the sure. sound of the water over the rocks. It's There is something, and I'm sure you're the same way, I mean, just growing up, Friends of mine would go camping, you know, just pull a truck up into the middle of the woods and we just, you know, light a fire or whatever. And we used to do this ridiculous game it's similar to telling ghost stories where we just say, OK, well, um, go out in the woods and just stand there and see how long you can stand there in the dark in, in, the, in the woods in the night. And uh, no one could make it very long because there is this terror that creeps over you that's inherent in the absence of. And and it's weird because we society latches on this meaning it's darkness it's evil it's satan you know it's the the murder behind the tree whatever it is we latch on this tone to it and and this can actually be found incredibly useful if if you're ever uh, i don't know if you've ever tried or, or are interested but uh, anton leve wrote a um an essay on how to become a werewolf mm -hmm. right. i think that's the title of it but it it's amazing, and, and, and just nature itself is the greatest catalyst for that. Uh, the darkness of the woods is just, I mean, and there's no, you know, there's there's good reason why every uh, decent horror movie is set out in the woods. <laughs> it's because, right. you know, nature is the last horror element that you just cannot cannot escape from. It's fantastic. So, yeah, I, I understand that, that darkness, uh, how it could come from, certainly if you lived your life there, I don't know. Did you ever have a moment? And and let me let me give a little um, example here to maybe illustrate my question. Um, I used to listen to a lot of. Uh, I still listen to a lot of uh, just hardcore music, and uh, I would like turn off lights, light candles, and just imagine uh, this. Uh, you know, suspending disbelief here, but imagining this this gateway to hell or this this demon. I would just sort of back up into it, like I am part of this darkness that everyone else is afraid of and and I always felt this warmth and this 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 welcoming that you know for myself 
in thinking that way. Like, I, I, I'm not afraid of this stuff because it's who I am. Did you ever have a moment like that uh, growing up? Yeah, absolutely. I think at times, too, I would definitely, my imagination would get away from me and I scare the crap out of myself, too. But but it wasn't very far from my house where I could just walk out, you know, like 50 feet and stand there, you know, amongst all the cricking, uh, the cr- well, the crickets at night and all the animals. And I would definitely, I, I mean, like you were saying, it's a part of us growing up, our, the, our um the ancient people were definitely more attuned to um, this type of nature than we are now. And I think when I was younger, I was much more attuned to it. But as I got older, I found the uh, safety of suburbia, I suppose, and um, things like that. You know, we're definitely, man has definitely separated himself from nature. And um, well, Christianity has a huge part of that as well. Yeah. But, uh, but even still here, even where I'm living now, um, I still... F- um, feel there's a part of me that has a longing for that. I still miss growing up where it's quiet all the time and the skies are really dark. You can actually see the stars and so forth. Nice. That's what I miss the most and <laughs> is, Absolutely. is staring up at the sky at night and, and only being able to see the moon because of the just ambient brightness of suburbia. Well, let's uh, let's stop teasing the audience here and let's play this track in vain I've sinned. And on the other side, We'll talk about your albums and maybe the future. Okie dokie. I'm speaking to Jeremiah Crone. You just heard In Vain I've Sinned. Now you know what I'm talking about, people. <laughs> it's good, right? 
Uh, Jeremiah, this album, how long did it take to put together? Yeah, this album probably took me about about eight months or so to do. The reason for that is I was teaching myself how to play those instruments that you hear in that song. So um, what I have is I, I have a little Tascam 8-track recorder, and it has dials on it and so forth. And this is a, a type of um, recording device I prefer to use as opposed to a computer. I really don't want to be clicking on anything with the mouse. You know, I'd much rather be touching things with my hands and so forth and bringing up levels and things like that. So, um, yeah, from beginning to end, um, even the very last song on there, I, I bet you I got a website out there for that probably a month after I was done with that album. And But I um, had so many songs left over that I, th I thought did not fit into that. I did a second album, which is called Distilled Funeral Hymns. And that's posted on my website as well. And the website is jeremiahcrow.com. I'll have it in the show notes for you people to check out. Uh, the album we're speaking to is the Dark Appalachian Gospel. Is your family supportive of this side of you? Uh, yeah, they're not surprised. Really? Yeah, <laughs> by any means. But yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, this was something that, you know, like, like my parents were... They, you know, I grew up with them. They, they saw my interest in things like this since I was very young, and you know, nothing surprises my wife anymore that comes <laughs> at him. So when I was doing something like that, you know, she would do the the plate nod. That's a uh, very nice dear. <laughs> so, wait to work on the next one, you know. <laughs> but but my daughter likes it. She thinks it's hilarious. You know, she likes uh, certain uh, some of my songs too. I I kind of uh, um, I. Just, my voice, I sound a bit more um, distorted, you know, I'll growl a bit at times here and there, and um, it's a lot of fun, so, yeah, um, and this is something I'm going to continue with as well, I have a, I'm working on a third album as we speak. Oh, very cool. Any uh, estimated time when that's going to be released? No, at, at this time, I think uh, probably early next year. Okay. Most likely. I'm, t I'm going to take my time with it, because the my second album, Distilled Funeral Hymns, I, in a way, I kind of rushed. Well, the songs just came out so quickly, I didn't. I just let it go as that. Um, with dark, with dark Appalachian Gospel, I sat. I sat on a couple songs, and I, you know, would would work on an intro or things like that. And when I was doing my second, I was really on a roll at that point. So um, with my third, I'm going to get much more abstract with it. My songs are going to be much longer, and and uh, yeah, I'm just doing this to please me, you know, and. Um, Whoever wants to, you know, if if I, if I appeal to certain people, I mean, that's wonderful. And the fact that you found some interest in it, too, I just think that's great. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, I mean, because you had mentioned that your your daughter, I don't know, thought part of it was funny or something. As an artist, as a musician, does it bother you when people laugh? I mean, not because it's traditionally funny, but because maybe there's just something uh, silly about a moment in it, or uh, maybe it's just your voice at that moment. No, not at all. I mean, I, I think that's great. I mean, the, the, my project is called Jeremiah Crow's Insufferable One Man Show. Yeah. And the, the word insufferable means horrible or difficult to endure. So I, um, yeah, I'm kind of poking fun at myself a little bit. I, I, I mean, you're not going to really sense it in my lyrics because I do sing um, Appalachian murder ballads and, you know, stories of sorrow and so forth. But um, I, I incorporate a sense of humor in everything that I do, mm -hmm. and um, and those that um, that do laugh, that's you know that's just fine. I don't usually have much to do with them, anyways. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's fantastic. Again, people check out jeremiahcrow.com. I'm talking to Jeremiah Crow himself about his album One Man Show, and you can actually check out uh, and pick up both albums for a surprisingly small amount of money. So. Um, check it out. You can actually preview the songs or listen to the whole songs on the website as well. Uh, is there um, anywhere you'd like to direct people to contact you? Uh, sure. JeremiahCrow.com is my uh, email address is posted on there. As well as I do have a Facebook page as well. And I just put that up recently so you can be one of my four friends on there. Or <laughs> likes, I suppose. <laughs> and as well as I threw stuff on YouTube. And I have a band camp page as well that's jeremiah crow's insufferable one man show dot band camp slash something 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 right. nice all right so uh check it out 
uh, and and really, it's it's been a pleasure talking to you. I really do dig your music, and I am looking forward greatly to your contribution with um, the Black House Blues project uh, that we're putting together. Yeah, absolutely, Adam. Thank you very much for the invite, and I do look forward to working with you on this song as well. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, hopefully I can talk to you about your new album when it comes out next year sometime, and uh, until then, Hell Satan. Hey, thank you. Hell Satan. And that's going to do it for another show. I hope you enjoyed it. I would love to hear from you. Visit the website 9centspodcast.com and send your correspondence to info at 9centspodcast.com. Let me know of any suggestions, critiques, corrections, or general comments you might have. You can visit the SatanNet, Facebook, Google+, Twitter, or MySpace page for 9 Cents and get updated on weekly topics. Download the show Monday night via my RSS feed found at 9centspodcast.com. We're also on Last.fm, Stitcher, Spotify, and YouTube, so look for us there. You can subscribe to 9 Cents via iTunes by searching 9 cents and don't forget to leave a rating and or comment if you'd like to learn more about the church of satan visit churchofsatan.com and keep in mind the only way that this podcast is going to live is if you tell a friend share nine cents with your friends your enemies your grandmother your grandfather yell your mom let's grow this ship together help spread the word and once again thank you for joining me and as always i'm your host adam campbell and until next week hail satan